Coronavirus, it is on the lips of the whole world. We're all talking about this thing. Some say, hey, this is not much worse than the uh, the annual flu. And some are saying this is a deadly pandemic and we are all at risk. What is the truth? Well, there's only a handful of people, actually not even a handful, a handful if I had one finger, <laughs> one person that I trust as a friend to go to to talk about all things health. He is a digital health technologist, perhaps the world's leading digital health strategist, and, and he helps talk about and define all things in health, medicine, technology, and he is also my friend, Mr. John Nasta. John, welcome to Joel Live. Let's talk Corona. Oh, you got your uh, you got your face mask ready. It's, it's, almost everything is shrouded in controversy today, Joel. So it's a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you. It's been a little bit of a while. Good to see you. It has been a while, and and I, I you know I am not prone to hysterics, and neither are you. Uh, you of all the people I know take a very um, objective, data driven approach to not just, you know, this particular issue, but really all things, you know, politics, um, current events, you're very much a scientist and an observer uh, and a truth seeker. It seems to me, you just want to know what is real. That's, uh, I try. And, and let's, let's jump into probably the most important thing that we can talk about today. And that's, that's the data coming out of the University of Washington uh, that the government is relying on. Those are the death projections, right? We started at 2.2 million, if mm -hmm. you remember. Mm -hmm. Then we kind of scrolled down and we, we got to 240,000, which still made it a catastrophic event. Um, just yesterday, the revised modeling put the projected deaths at 60,000. Now, any way you slice that, it's horrible. But what we have to begin to look at is some contextual understanding of what the 60,000 means. And, um, you know, the, the, the early discussion was, is it the flu? Is it a bad flu? Is this a new type of disease? And, and the data suggests that we could be a little bit more optimistic. So the good news is, if you look at traditional seasonal flu, the, the deaths annually are probably between 25 and 61,000 a year. So what we're seeing is corona kind of pushing at the up, upper limit of that. So, so I think that we have to put that into some kind of broad perspective. Now, that being said, I was just off the phone with a cardiologist who's talking about people in horrible pulmonary failure in hospitals, mm -hmm. patients who are having cardiac abnormalities, having significant inflammatory reactions in their body. So the, the central kernel of truth for me is that the number of deaths is down, but it's still an unusual life-threatening condition. So that's, I guess that's what it comes down to oh, that okay. balance. Let's, How do we articulate? I want to, let's rewind because I've got so many questions mm -hmm. around this as I know mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, viewers will as well. And if you're watching on the Be Live page, you can type questions. And if we've got time, we can get to some of those. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us, you know, what is the coronavirus? The corona, you know, the coronavirus is this little viral ball, okay, that has spikes on it. And it looks like the sun. Like that. Yeah, there you go. So so that's the coronavirus. It's a star viruses that um, stick onto cells and get inside the cells and replicate. The interesting thing is the virus is not quite alive in the conven conventional sense of, of the word. Viruses can't multiply. Mm -hmm. They need a host. They need us to get into our bodies, infect our cells, and make our cells into virus factories. And, and when that happens, the virus multiplies and it manifests in diseases. So, so that's what the coronavirus is. Um, how, how is it, it different it is from, from other viruses? Get real technical. Huh? Yeah. Well, well, how does it not, vary from like the flu? Well, it's similar in the sense that it's something called a single-strand RNA virus that has a, a lipid envelope around it. So, so it's a simple virus, okay? It's surrounded by a lipid 
envelope. And the reason, the interesting thing about the lipid envelope is how do you wash your clean fats with soap and water, right? I mean, if you have a greasy dish with a lot of fat on it, you need soap, you need a detergent, and that detergent emulsifies the fat. So the interesting thing about this virus, as with, as with many viruses, that soap is a really, really good way to get rid of it. To That's a great, it. I appreciate you making, you know, some things that are either because we're not being told or because it's seemingly mm -hmm. complex, simple. That's the first time I've heard somebody explain it as like an oil, like a lipid. And, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to scrub away at that to get it off my hands. That's why it takes 20 seconds of cleaning with, with warm water and soap. Yep. Yep. Simple, simple soap. Okay. So, you know, so let's talk about transmission then, because we hear all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Oh, it can survive on the surface of cardboard, you know, and, and it's, you know, if somebody it's in the air and it's going out for 20 feet and we all need to wear face masks, what do we know for sure? Well, we know that it is transmitted by particulate transfer, that it's not probably, again, this is still, you know, we're learning this, this is going to be an epidemiologic I don't even know what to call it. You know, the epidemiologists are are so excited about this because it really is a clinical laboratory. So let's let's at least discuss what we know. It seems to be particulate in the sense that you have to get particles. If you cough, that cough flows through the air. Now there's some data that shows that it's six feet, twelve feet, eighteen feet. I'm sure you've seen those mm -hmm. those photographs of people sneezing. Right. You know, with it shows oh, that's it. That's that's the transmission mechanism of the COVID-19 virus, okay? It could be perceived as airborne because it might go 10, 12, 14 feet down an aisle of a supermarket where you think that you're at that six, um, you know, that six foot safety zone. So it's not airborne, right? It doesn't appear to be airborne, but we do have conflicting data every now and then that, that there's suggestions that it might be. I, I would say that it's probably not. And the reason I believe that is because I think that some of the social distancing that we're seeing now is resulting in some very, very positive changes in the disease, in the new cases, in the rate of the of the curve going up. So if it were traditionally airborne, there you go. If it if it was now, probably the most important thing for you to wear with that mask is it prevents you from transmitting those airborne particles. Okay, so this mask, which, by the way, you know, the custom pizza, I call mm -hmm. me pizza face, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's fabric, right? That's yeah. all this is, is fabric. Right. So this is helping for me to not transmit to others, but this does will not stop from me being a recipient of okay. the virus. I want you to think about that, okay? okay. Let, let's just think about this. The virus is not airborne, Okay. Okay. Therefore, the microscopic particles of the virus, the virus itself, these nanoparticles in a virus are not transmitted in the air. So the use of a mask as, a, as an, an n 95 -er or some of these high-end masks may not be appropriate in, in, in public, let's say. Because what you're doing is you're trying to prevent the particulate, the spit, Okay, stop the spit is is kind of uh, stop the sneeze, stop the spit is probably a better articulation. And if you sneeze and I'm six feet from you, chances are you're not going to get that wave of particulate matter that is a conduit for the virus. You're not filtering the virus, right? These filtration stories about the mask. That's not what we're doing. So it's keeping away from from bodily fluids. And you do that by putting a mask on. Can you potentially prevent the inhalation of particulate matter with a vac? Sure, you can. Yeah. I mean, but it's, I think it's better large, than nothing. Right? It's just you know, it, it's. Well, I, think it's like, I think it's much better than nothing. It's like a you um, know a a, a, um, a a condom is not a hundred percent right. They break and stuff can get through, and somebody can become you're, pregnant. You're, 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 you're sounding like. Um, I'm not even going to say who. Um, I don't want to get too political today. Maybe later, you know, when I get warmed up. But but you 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 know, 
Condoms don't break, right? Condoms are highly effective. Once in a blue moon, they break, but we don't make social policy on breaking, right? We don't make social policy on disease prevention on the broken condom. So what you're saying so, is a so bad analogy is what you're saying. No, I'm just saying that you can find the exception to almost any rule. We don't make, okay. we don't legislate, right? We don't, we don't build clinical practice, public health policy on, on exceptions. So for me, a mask is really effective for a couple of reasons. One, it prevents the potentially asymptomatic patient. Now that's the other thing, right? I go to the food store, right? And I'm going to buy my chips and, and whatever, but I might be sick. So I might have the virus, but I'm not as guarded about wearing a mask because, well, I don't have to wear a mask. So wearing a mask might protect me from contaminating surfaces and people. So, you know, that's that's point number one. Point number two is sometimes when you wear a mask, it's a reminder. It's like putting a piece of string on your finger. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a simple reminder that these are critical times where we have to be careful. Okay, fair mm -hmm. enough. So now I have this question about herd immunity, right? Because mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. under lockdown and we're told stay in, go out. If you're going to exercise, don't gather in groups. Some places are being more um, uh, Gestapo, for the lack of a better yeah. word about it, than others. Uh, you know, I've got friends in Puerto Rico, which is part of America. It's just not a, a, a state. And they are like, mm -hmm. stay in if you, you know, except for if your license plate ends in this on these days, you can go to the store. But if you're out other than that, we can throw you in prison for six months and mm -hmm. find you $5,000. And we don't have that going on here in Denver. I can go out. No problem. Do. But we're we're basically telling people don't go to work where you can be in your cubicle, but go to the grocery store where everybody's congregating. Does does that make sense? Well, look, it's an it's an imperfect world, and we have to take measures that are at least consistent with living somewhat of a life. You know, for example, we have to eat, mm -hmm. right? We have to get food, yeah. so you know we have to get medicines. So um, it, it's not an all or nothing. We're trying to decrease the communication of potential virus between people. So. You know, you can you can do a complete lockdown, sure that that, but that it's just not functional. I guess you can ask people not to breathe, well, right? Don't breathe. That's, There'll be no transmission, right. no transmission. Well, but isn't that carrying that sort of lunacy to its illogical conclusion? Right. So, so for me, I think that you know that that's that, that, that's part of the issue here now. You know, but I think that um, that it's 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 not just something as simple as a lockdown. I think we're going to see sort of changes over time in that, that we might have a, a bit of a relaxing of policy and then looking for hotspots. You know, it's, I think it's very funny that we talk about the number of deaths in the United States as an aggregate. Mm -hmm. It's almost meaningless to me because it's kind of like saying the number of deaths in the EU. What does that mean? Look how, how potent and valuable the data coming out of Italy was. And it wasn't even Italy. It was the northern region of Italy. And that helped us from an epidemiologic perspective, from a clinical perspective, but also from a social perspective, because we could see this. If we aggregated the data into the EU, we would know nothing. Same thing, you know, with Denver, with Washington, with, with California, with New York, with, with New Orleans. And I think once we identify hotspots, we'll be able to, to um, potentially impact what's going on locally and that, that may allow us to um, to change the dynamic a little bit. Right. Well, people in, you know, rural America, they for them, life goes on. You know, they got to go 45 minutes to get to a market anyhow, and they're doing what they're doing. But, you know, here in Denver, I just pulled up the latest numbers, and let me see if I can pull this up on the, uh, the screen to share. Uh, we'll go ahead and put this up on its own right there. Okay, so you can see here uh, it looks like cases – reported mm -hmm. here are, have dropped, you know, pretty significantly over right. the past few days. Um, what, what do you, is this due to what? quarantining or is it you due to herd I, immunity? No, no, I don't think it's, I mean, you know, herd immunity is an acquired immunity over time. And I, I don't think we're that soon. You know, you look at the number of cases, they may be going down, but the deaths might still be high. Let's see if we've got that here. That's cases, number of deaths by county, but that's okay. Here we go. Yeah, Cumulative number cases. of deaths by reported date. So it's 
-hmm. it's slowed Top. down. Yeah. But what we see is that the number of deaths is a lagging indicator. These people have been sick for a while. Right. So you can't look at deaths, even though that's a very powerful indicator. If you look at new cases, that tell you that people are getting sick less frequently or the rate of change. You know, it can still be going up, but the rate with which it's going up could be flattening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I think it comes down to, Joel, is, is this idea of um, – it's 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 an adaptive response and it's not it's not just a response social isolation lock yourself in your house it's an adaptive response and i think that that you could even expand upon that a little bit more that what we need is is an agile response Let, let's back up and talk about that a little bit because okay. right now we're just saying run in your house and lock the door All right that's sort of the uh, that's the, the strategy. Mm -hmm. and, and another way of articulating that strategy is let's close the country. All right, let's take a $2 trillion hit, right? And let's close everything down. That is a response out of ignorance. Now, ignorance is a very valuable tool because when the disease first emerged in the United States, we were operating under the parameters of ignorance. We didn't know how the disease manifested clinically. We didn't know if it was a primary lung disease, which we originally thought. Now we're thinking it's really a systemic disease, an immunological cytokine reaction that is systemic, but tends to manifest either first or early in the lungs. But now we're, going, we're beginning to look at how can we mitigate this? So for me, it's an adaptive response. So in some cities, like your city or, or in the Midwest where there are very few cases, we may be able to begin to open businesses. We may be able to have a, an opportunity to be adaptive to our response. If something comes back, if we have the opportunity to test, and now we've got five-minute tests from Abbott, we're really doing great work on the testing, we could revisit the lockdown. We could revisit control. So for me, it's loosen the standards, be vigilant, watch what's going on. And if something starts to come back, we can clamp down. But that's a regional dynamic. right? And that, that's, that's the other sort of kind of issue. We, we, we as a country are a loosely structured federation of states. And that's part of the magic of the United States is that states control their, their systems from education to health. Now, I think we have to empower states to do that with the information and the support of the country. And that's, that's where this agility, that's where that response is going to be so important. So, so when the president talks about talking to the governors, this is not just a, an arbitrary sort of discussion or engagement. This is our government functioning the way it was designed because the best decisions are going to be made regionally. And as this adaptive and agile response comes into play, we'll be able to open up our country in a way that makes sense. Similarly, we may be able to lock it down too if we have to. New Orleans, right? What's going to happen in New Orleans? A lot of old people, a lot of people, a lot of indigent people, a lot of people who are obese, coronary artery disease, hypertension, right? It's, it's a problem, and let's see how it plays out. That Is that why we saw um, such a, a higher death rate in Italy because it's an older population and multi-generational living together? Yeah. You know, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of theories about that. Some people have refuted the multi-generational living a little bit. It seems to make sense to me. Um, I, I think that, that, that definitely an older population, without a doubt, uh, but in dramatic contrast to that is if you look at healthcare expenditure um, as a function of GDP, Italy is the number one, spends the most, and has arguably one of the better healthcare systems in the EU. So isn't it interesting? 8.8% of their GDP goes to healthcare. Hmm. So even in the context of a good healthcare system, um, th there were some problems there. You know, there were, you know, it could be genetic. We know that, that sometimes people have a genetic predisposition to some kind of a receptor. There's this receptor in the lungs called the ACE 
receptor, ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme. And anybody who's on a bit on a high blood pressure medication knows about ACE inhibitors and ARBs, very, very common pills. But there may be some relationship there between, um, between the ACE receptor, the angiotensin receptor, and, and the Italian population. You know, it's much more of a monolithic population. Add to that, there may be a genetic predisposition. We see this disease attacks men more frequently than women. And that's, that's across countries. But the other thing that's kind of interesting to me, and I know this is, this is a bit controversial, but we talk about the viral load. How much virus were you exposed to, right? Were you exposed to, oh, you know, in, 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 in microbiology, we talk about the inoculum. You need to have 10,000 germs to get an infection, right? Hmm. And if you, have, if you have 100 germs, it doesn't matter. Your body will kill it. But if you have 10,000 or 100,000, I'm not sure which is, but you need this inoculum. And if you expose people to the virus in, in a larger concentration, that may have something to do with it. And here's the point I'm getting at, is that we looked at our, um, at our manufacturing and supply chain dynamics in this country years ago, and we made a Faustian bargain. We said, we're going to get our stuff from China and for India, from India, because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. And we we're going to make our supply chain rather precarious for the sake of making a buck. And that's a discussion we can have later. It's an interesting one, and it's an important one. Interestingly, Wuhan has a special relationship with northern Italy. All those products, those uh, high-end luxury goods, um, had manufacturing relationships with the region of Wuhan. So there were a lot of people. There was a tremendous exchange there, travel exchange. There were direct flights. Mm -hmm. So again, what does that mean? Did that provide a higher inoculum? Did it cook asymptomatically for a while? I don't think it's as simple as, as grandma living with us. I think that the, the, the decision is multifactorial and becomes one that is not only clinical, but economic. And that's, to me, that's really where it gets very interesting. Inoculum sounds sounds like you know he's related to uh, Optimus Prime or something, <laughs> a transformer. Okay, so what about hydroxychloroquine? Right, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of controversy around it, and everything that I'm reading says this stuff might work. Okay, so so let's let's take a step back. What the heck is hydroxychloroquine? Yes, yes please. Right. Okay. Well, it's, it's a drug that's been around for 40 years. It's related to the early drugs, the quinine-type drugs that, that were used to treat malaria. And this has an immunological and antiviral activity. It's been used for 50 years. It's used in oh, probably a few um, typical clinical populations. One is it's used for malaria prophylaxis. So if you travel you'll take a dose of this. It's also used for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And those two conditions are autoimmune conditions where your body's immune system attacks itself. So these drugs have been used for a long time. And there have been a few, just a handful of studies, one out of France that I think had I don't know, about 20 patients, another one out of, uh, out of China that had, I believe, 60 patients, and, and another one with 30 patients. And they've been... Um, Inconclusive, I guess, is the word that, 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 that I would say. Now, let's take the anecdotal evidence and set that aside. Because anecdotal evidence, I can tell you something about almost anything that works magically. I, I recall the days of Laetrile, the anti-cancer drug that came from, right. from pits, apricot pits. It was a wonder drug, and people were swearing by it. It didn't work. It was garbage. And a lot of people died because they put their faith in it. Um, but when you look at hydroxychloroquine, what we're seeing is that, that some of the studies show that it was, it offered no benefit, right, in that, in that one larger study. But it did show um, that the patients that received the hydroxychloroquine had a 90% recovery. Those who were on the control had, a, had a, you know, an 86 or 90% recovery. Of that small cohort, four patients went on to severe illness, okay? They ended up in the ICU really sick. All of the four patients were in the control group, so they didn't get hydroxyquinolone. What does that tell us? Absolutely nothing, 
Okay, there's no statistical significance, but it is the science of observation. So, you know, when it comes to hydroxychloroquine, I think that there is there is a promise there. The anecdotal data is amazing, almost too good to be true. People take it in 12 hours later, they're cured. That makes me more nervous than more optimistic, quite frankly. Hmm. But because it's a short course of therapy, right? It's a it's a five-day course or a six or seven or eight-day course of therapy with or without that other drug called azithromycin. And that's something we've all taken. That's called a Z-Pack, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that that's given away um, almost like candy. That's your that's your standard antibiotic, right? That is one of many standard antibiotics. There's there are the penicillins, there are the uh, you know aminoglycosides. Uh, these are the uh, um, this is azithromycin uh, azolide that is a different class. The nice thing about this drug is you can take it for five days, three to five days. It's a short course of therapy. It's been shown to be effective against upper respiratory tract infections, but um, you know, because it's a short course of therapy, and now we've got thousands and thousands of patients in clinical trials, double-blind clinical trials, um, I think we're going to find find that news any day now. I, I've heard rumors of some positive data, some very powerful data that should break soon. But again, it's a rumor. It, it's a rumor. I, I would not put, put faith in it. Now, the other side to the hydroxychloroquine issue is toxicity, right? You want to jump into that a little bit? Well, yeah, okay. go ahead. Let's talk about it. Okay, because a lot of people have said it kills you, right? No, it, it, it does something called prolongs the QT segment. That's that little bump at the end of your EKG. And, and if it gets longer and longer and longer, it predisposes us to have that nasty arrhythmia called ventricular fibrillation or uh, ventricular tachycardia or torsade de point, if you want to be fancy. And, and, Yes, these drugs do prolong the QT. Interestingly, both hydroxychloroquine prolongs the QT, but so does azithromycin, so does the z pack So where is the public health outrage at the inappropriate and callous use of the z pack when it could potentially kill people? It's only now in the context of the coronavirus that people are getting all hypersensitive about this QT prolongation. Now, a couple things. One is that these drugs are used together so that both of the drugs will prolong that QT segment. So that could be problematic. That's a red flag, right? But on the other side of that coin is that these drugs, particularly hydroxychloroquine, is 50 years old. It's been used in millions of patients. And the patients who take it now, the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus take it every day for years, okay? okay? I'm not talking about five or six day course of therapy, 10 day course of therapy. I'm talking about years, day after day after day. Where is the public health outcry for the QT prolongation and ventricular arrhythmias that should be caused by this? Well, so again, I think that, people to be outraged. I mean, that's we really do right. have psychological operations going on that people medically follow the herd, her, you know, forget herd immunity. There's herd mentality, uh, which yeah. is why, you know, you've seen me posting questioning everything. I'm, I'm highly yeah. skeptical about everything surrounding this. I'm not doubting that, yes, people are dying and yes, it's horrible. Uh, because I understand that something like 80 to 90 percent of people that are put on ventilators don't survive, right? Once you get that far, yeah, the, the, roughly it's an 80 20 rule when you look at this. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, younger patients do better, but but the point the point I want to get back that, is, about, that, is that under any circumstances that somebody's put on a ventilator? No, 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 it's you know, once you get a little bit out longer, you know, one of the things about, about the COVID syndrome is that people are on the vent for a long time, like two weeks. And, and it's a really, really complicated thing because there's a tube down your throat, right? Mm. That tube sits in your trachea, okay? And the trachea starts to break down mm. because of the friction of the tube and the balloon at the end of the tube. So sometimes you have to put a hole in people's neck and do a trachea and go in this way. So it's complicated. People get bacterial infections. The worst place to be when you're sick is in a hospital, right? Because that's where all the bugs are. Right. You know, but I, I want to come back to this issue of, of, you know, of hydroxychloroquine. 
um, it it seems like there is some data to support its use. Okay, so I think that I think that that clinical trials are absolutely mandatory. It's a short course of therapy. We should be able to fix this this issue pretty quickly. Um, what what I'm what I'm particularly confused about is why people are jumping on the toxicity bandwagon. You know, think about this. The second, you know, what the second leading cause of liver transplant in the United States is what? Tylenol. Really, Tylenol. Which tylenol. We, we really do. Tylenol is like candy. I mean, you just buy it off the shelf, and there's extra right. strength, and people take it regularly for you know for yeah. pain, for headaches, and some habitually. Well, that it kills your liver, right? And so you know, look at aspirin. Aspirin makes you bleed out. It causes strokes in your head. You know, it causes gastric ulcers. You know, you it's very easy to kind of look at hydroxychloroquine and say, oh, prolongs the QT. By the way, I don't know what the QT is, right? Or it causes an arrhythmia. By the way, I don't even know what an arrhythmia is, but we latch onto it from probably a an emotional perspective that oftentimes seems to be strangely mediated by 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 your political proclivities. And I, and this really bothers me. Um, because I, I want to follow the data. And, and so, you know, now, now that being said, there are lots of other good, good therapies out there. So I, I don't think that hydroxychloroquine alone is, is the only one we have to put in our basket. You know? Well, let me, before we move on to these others, let me ask about this. There's a video that's going viral right now from a, uh, an MD in Kansas city. And he is, he's mad. Um, and he was yeah. saying that, look, what we're discovering is that you know quinine, I guess, is in uh, Schweppes tonic water. That he's wrong. He's wrong. Okay, but let me finish he's what wrong. he said. He said tonic water in zinc as a preventative measure. So tell me why he's uh, why he's wrong. The, the amount of quinine in that water, you probably have to drink like twenty gallons a day to have any any <laughs> any semblance of a therapeutic. Living dose. in the bathroom. So, don't go there. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, the whole issue of zinc potentially, but, but in terms of, of, of quinine water, you know, I, I, I've seen the video. I don't know who this guy is. He calls himself doctor, right? right? You know, I'm a doctor too. I have an honorary PhD from the University of Bolivia. So you can call me a doctor if you want. I don't know what his credentials are. I look for a website. Does he have an office website or some kind of credentialing? Just, just, just a little, one more step. So he gets on, he does his raves, you know, he rants. So uh, again, I, uh, there's a lot of, lot there, of chatter. There's a um, lot of chatter out there and everybody's got an opinion. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just mm -hmm. super skeptical. And, you know, what, what are your thoughts on not quarantine cleaning? Uh, put aside the, uh, the yeah. obvious yeah. influx sure. of, uh, peep the, uh, into the medical system, right? Our health system clearly can get overloaded if you get a, too many mm -hmm. people that are sick and there's not enough beds and not enough doctors and not enough equipment, okay? Put that mm -hmm. aside for a moment. Would we as a society had been better served to just go about business as usual and not kill the global economy and have this massive unemployment? Would there be that's enough a, immunity? That's a perfect it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. And it is a question that's best discussed in the context of hindsight. It's a retrospective decision. If, if you're moving forward and you want to make your best bet for an outcome, you often err on conservative. So do I want to put my society at risk and potentially have 2 million people die? Or do I want to roll the dice on herd herd immunity. And, you know, England started out that way. They talked about herd immunity and, and, and that changed quickly. I believe that Sweden wanted to do something in herd immunity, but then some of their hospitals were overwhelmed and they decided to change that. Um, so for me, jumping to the notion of herd immunity is kind of like saying, well, it, it should work. So let's expose our community to this virus and hope for the best. I just don't think it was the right time Given, given what we know, uh, particularly in Italy, it's, it just scares the hell out of clinicians when you're seeing patients, you know, on respirators, when you're seeing patients decompensate within the course of hours. Now, that being said, 
Um, I live in New Jersey. Okay, I live in in one of the hot spot general areas. I'm a little bit more west out of the the main areas, but there's a county, Bergen County, which has 22 percent of the cases and 18 percent of the deaths. Hmm. It has a good amount. It's right across the river from New York. Now that's a hot so, spot. That's a hot spot, right? Mm -hmm. What I did is I looked at the five or six hospitals in Bergen County today. And I looked at the EMS site. So I kind of went in through the back door to look at what's called hospital diversion. If you're an ambulance driver, you have someone who's injured, you go to the hospital that you're designated unless there's a diversion. It, it's, it's on the radio. It says you can't go there. They're closed because they're either too busy, their ICU doesn't have enough beds, whatever it may be. None of the hospitals in Bergen County are diverting patients. They're open for business. Hmm. So these are the confounding factors that, that I don't understand, that we are told that, this, that hospitals are overwhelmed. And that was the whole thing about flattening the curve, right? Remember, it was the, the curve, and then underneath the curve was the hospital capacity. Right. And if the curve got over the capacity, then everything would, would go to hell in a handbasket. We would have patients dying in the hallways. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not exactly sure why that's not happening the way it played out. So well, it's, again, yeah, it's just one other really good point, John. And and you know, there's a model. I think it's the H I M E model, right? That a lot mm -hmm. of this was based on. One. And and they yep. were saying with proper social distancing, we're still looking at you know what a couple of two. Uh, I don't know. It was two hundred thousand or so. Bingo, bingo. You, you just then, hit the key distinction, right? Revise it. Then it's, oh, it's 120,000. Then it's 80,000. Now it's 60,000. And what that tells me is we've, we've had bad modeling because we're doing the things they base the model on. So what's really going on? Yeah. You, you know, you, you said something very interesting. And, and what people are saying is that the reason the number came down to 60,000 60, is because we're doing such a good job of social distancing, right? That's wasn't what we that hear. built in. Wasn't that already baked yeah. into the model? Exactly. The last time around, when we had 120 or or 200, it said that these horrific numbers would only be met if we practiced the strictest of social distancing. So again, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that this model is based on strict distancing and then and then re forecast it and say that that it's well we must be doing a really good job in social distancing it's more complex than that and i don't think it's i don't think it's one answer i think we ran into this we threw ourselves into this emergency and we made assumptions and and if you if you're five percent off here and five percent off and ten percent off there and and sixteen percent off here the whole thing gets really screwed up what do those assumptions part. from China that lied to us early on, saying it wasn't transmissible from person to person? And then Trump did the travel ban in January anyhow, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and they called him xenophobic for doing so. Uh, here, here's my question. How many lives do you think that travel ban and then the subsequent European travel ban ended up saving in America? Yeah, yeah. I mean... I'm, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to peg it with a number because we know how, how, how hard those numbers are, even the best of models. By the way, uh, the University of Washington model did peg, peg some of, um, you know, the data pretty closely, so it wasn't all bad, you know. But I think that yes, I think what Trump did in banning travel, um, you know, where he was clearly characterized as a xenophobic, uh, uh, tyrannical leader, saved lives. Um, I also think that our, our lead, number, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think it was a significant number um, because because I think this virus sort of incubated. You know, it's the inoculum kind of thing that it kind of cooked for a while, like it did in in Washington and at the at the nursing home. So you know, I think that it's it, it's complicated, but I think that nobody knew how to manage this. Okay, nobody knew how to manage this. We've never seen this. And it's really, really easy to point fingers. And that, right. that's what really upsets me is that we're starting to blame blame the ruling class for bad management because it's politically expedient. No, you know, and I, I think that's this. We've not seen this before. You know, I remember when uh, H1N1 hit, was that is that bird flu? Yeah. Was that, uh, it took yeah. a thousand deaths in the United States, a thousand Americans dead before Obama 
you know, declared an emergency around it. Well, you know, Joel, as I'm a, I'm a first responder, right? I've been involved uh, in emergency preparedness. I was the president of the local rescue squad. I've, I've been involved in this on a very grassroots level, boots on the ground. And, and tragically, I've always found that emergency preparedness is sort of one part social training. Let's go have the drill and everybody comes out and, you know, we do what we do. Then we have a party kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's also crossing your fingers. So I think that we have not been well prepared. And um, looking at prior administrations, they haven't been well prepared. Looking at the states, remember, it's principally the responsibility for the states to manage emergency preparedness. So right. when you look at things like respirators, um, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing to go around. But, but, you know, I'd rather not just go down that road. Let's be smart. Let's follow the data and stop pointing fingers. And if hydroxychloroquine works, let's jump on that bandwagon. If it doesn't, let's make a decision quickly. But, you know, what I, what I find is that it's just, you know, it, it, it's it's difficult when when you play the, the blame blame game. No one. I think the scope of some of the clinical consequences have been extraordinary. That's part of the problem here. OK, people crash when they get this condition. Right. They get really sick really fast um, with traditional flu viral syndromes. We had a little bit of time. You know, you, you got sick, you went to the doctor, you got hospitalized. Some people tragically died, right? From 28 to 61 million die. I'm sorry, 1,000 die. But with this, people crash and burn real fast. Yeah. And I think that scared the heck out of people. So it's, it's, that, it's the peak of the disease that, that has been problematic. You know, I, I have a couple friends, I've seen this multiple times on Facebook, that were super sick mm -hmm. in January or February before yeah. this blew up. They, I mean, my friend uh, Travis Wright said, I remember when he was down with it, he's like, this is the worst flu I've ever mm -hmm. had. Um, is it possible yeah. that he yeah. experienced that? Without a doubt. Hmm. Without a doubt. And that, and that may be part of, you know, sort of this emerging herd immunity in California, that this may have been around for a while. So, so it, know, I mean, I was around him right before that. So odds are I was exposed to it back in January. There was a city in Italy that, that they looked at, they tested everyone in the city. And I think it was 70, 80% of the people who claimed that they were not sick had immunity from the virus. Really? In other words, they had been exposed to the virus. So, you know, how long does immunity last? Is it, you know, is it sustained immunity? Um, the other thing, I, you know, I want to get back because I think that the issue around China is something that we're going to, it's the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the elephant in the room. And the World Health and, Organization that seems to be in China's back pocket. Now, I am, I am a designated technology expert by the World Health Organization. So, you know, I, I guess I have that imprimatur somewhere, um, you know, in my biography. But I think that... Um, that you look at, at the data coming out of China, um, it's it's largely suspect. I think that's pretty clear. I don't think that they have been candid. But we know this. This is the MO of an oppressive communist regime. This is what they do. So, you know, wh why does a, a, a scorpion sting? Because it's, it's their nature. That's what it does. So, you know, as much as we want to kind of open our arms to China, we have to recognize that from, from intellectual property to, you know, to adequate reporting epi epidemiologic issues on corona, I don't trust them. And, and this has been echoed to me by a variety of friends who, who shall be nameless, people who do business with the Chinese government on a regular basis. This is a problem. So, so what do we do? You know, how do we reestablish a supply chain? that allows us to have meds when we when we need it. How do we make a, a smartphone that costs $600 or $500? How do we do it? That, that's a real problem. If we want to manufacture everything in the United States, is our smartphone going to be $4,000? Mm -hmm. And how's that going to impact our ability to buy and sell these things? Mm -hmm. So it's complex. But what, what's to more say. important, our ability to get a smartphone made cheap or having the medication 
you know, the, the medicines that we need. Uh, my understanding is a lot of our supply is coming from China. And if you need your blood pressure medication yeah. or whatever, you know, if to balance your chemicals in your brain and we don't have that, yeah. now we have real chaos. You know, well, we used, to, we used to manufacture a lot of pharmaceuticals in Puerto Rico. That was, that was home base for pharmaceutical manufacturing probably about 20, 25 years ago, not that long ago. But what we've looked is we've, we're driven by profit margin. So we have a precarious supply chain because we are being penny wise and pound foolish. So we can get the cheap um, compound, APAP, that's used to make acetaminophen. And we can buy it in bulk from third world countries who manufacture it in, in rather lousy manufacturing standards. You know, when you actually manufacture acetaminophen from that raw compound, you end up throwing a lot of it away. So it's not like it's, it's pure manufacturing, you know. There, there, there are some issues there, but I think we've got to look at that, and we have to make some hard and fast decisions. And maybe the answer is that you keep your smartphone for three years. God forbid. I know, right? You know? I need to upgrade. It's funny. I've uh, the MacBook I've had, I've had for about six years now. It's a workhorse, yeah. And and I don't want yeah. a new one because I don't like that they've removed all of the different ports from it. Yeah. So I'm going to work that thing to you know to the bone. Yeah. Let yeah. me ask you this: There's I've been reading about how uh, they are seeing a drop in deaths from the things we traditionally see: the flu, pneumonia, heart attacks, because mm -hmm. they're classifying any death that somehow somebody who has COVID-19, it's a death by COVID-19. Take a, take a look at that. Can I, can I try to play a video? There won't be audio for it. I mean, if you know, I'm, playing, I'm just going to play it on my, on my phone. Oh, you're going to hold it up. Would it work? If yeah, you, I'm going to hold it up. Is that, is that too cheesy yeah. for, yeah. for even Joel? No, go ahead. Let's, right, let's see if we can get it. this here. And now, story time with John Nasta. Featuring yeah, here we go. No, so, so anyway, what I want to show you, basically, if I can find it here, is that I know exactly the curve you're talking about, right? It looked at the occurrence of pneumonia, mm -hmm. right? And what happened was they took an ice pick view of that. And it stopped when the curve was on the bottom, right? Okay. I mean, people didn't just stop having heart attacks. I mean, it's no. I mean, and that was you know who you know who that story ran. That story ran in the New York Times. Uh -huh. Where are all the heart attacks? Mm. So I think that that people who are sick don't want to go to the doctor. So right. So th so I think there is an element of deferred care, right? So you know that that's one thing. Um, the other thing is if you okay. So I see the cur there's a lot of curves going on there. A lot of data, yeah. Watch the curve. Is this animating? Oh, it is. Okay. Coming down, coming down, coming down. Coming down. down. Right. Well, That's me, where uh, they took the picture. Watch it coming down, right? See, so go down. Yep. They took the picture when it was at the lowest point, but over time, when you when you actually do the data, it recovers and and you do get the same amount of pneumonia. So that was a that was a, a lagging indicator. So be careful. They did a freeze frame. But but it actually came back up when you when you populated the data with all the reporting from the next month. So be careful about about that. So I don't think that it's 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 being we're misinterpreting Corona for something else. What is? But that? it is interesting that things like heart attacks seem to be you know the cardiologist sitting around waiting. Uh, I'm curious. Um, somebody else asked this question. What does an ice pick view mean? What is that? Well, if I if I sh it, it means you stop it, you freeze frame. Oh, okay. This is what it looks like at that moment in time. Got it. Right. Got but it. when the data starts to come in from the next month, it kind of backfills the prior month, so that when you see that whole thing come together, it actually rises up. And this year doesn't seem to be any different. So, you know, I, I just be I'd be guarded about that. Again, there's there's a lot of 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 half truths. Okay, speaking yeah. of half truths, uh, mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you for all the information today. I knew I could mm -hmm. count on you to to deliver. I've got one. I want to deal with conspiracy sure. theory here. On I love the conspiracy theory. Last theory. bit, and there's so ancient, many ancient alien. What is the thing? Ancient alien it's theorists say yes. Yeah. So you probably when I say conspiracy, there's probably a lot of different ones going through your mind right now. But what I want to talk about is five G. 
because when mm. you go down the conspiracy rabbit hole, they are saying that the globalists are wanting to depopulate, um, you know, in order to do to, to do their nefarious bidding. But my question is, is 5G dangerous to our health? No. Next question. It, 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 well, based on what? Extra, you know, give me okay. more. Okay, Let, let's. I know. I was, I was being. I was kidding. Um, look, the, obviously, we will learn a lot of things um, about five G. Five G. They say it's well. It's non-ionizing radiation. So to me, radiation, okay, causes vibration, movement. That that's what five G is. It's a vibratory kind of thing. Now. now Electromagnetic radiation is passing through your body all the time. I feel it. It's doesn't it? Yeah, sometimes people can, you know? But the thing is, does it pop an electron out? Does it ionize the molecules to cause disruption in the DNA that causes cancer? Mm -hmm. You know? So that's always been the, the fundamental argument about, about 5G. Well, they used to it, say that that having a microwave. I remember when microwave started, I was little. You were, we were both young when anyway. microwave you know, uh, ovens first came out and they're like, this is going to kill everybody. You know, we're old yep. enough to remember that. Well, is, is microwave radiation part of the reason we have a higher incidence of cancer now? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert. I don't, I don't want to speak to that. I mean, if keeping your cell phone in your pocket, does that, you know, cause a higher incidence of, of, of some sort of abdominal Issue or cancer? Or what about talking with your phone? Man, right, right. You don't keep your phone in your. The phone. data, the data seems to refute that, you know, and 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 so so you know, of all the things to be worried about, somehow we worry about five G electromagnetic radiation. Yet we get on the highway and drive our car at eighty miles an hour and text, <laughs> and and we are probably ten thousand times more likely to die or be harmed from that. But you know what? Doesn't matter. So I think it's relative risk, and from what I understand, the relative risk seems to be rather small. Right. Well, I mean, driving fast and not, you know, and being distracted—that's a personal choice. We don't have a choice over five G. No, it's not. No, it's not, Joel. It's not a personal choice. What about the other guy in the other car that I hit? Sure. Okay. Was it his personal choice? So I guess a conspiracy theorist would say, though, uh, we haven't they didn't invent cars and texting so that the population would go down. Uh, the conspiracy theorists would say that 5G is designed to make the population ill. And and uh, again, I don't mm. that doesn't make sense to me. Because it's, not, it's not a very smart got, way to do it. Wh who? What about the people that would be, you know, in charge masterminding this? How do they protect themselves? Well, they have a special, you know, magnetic shield around them. And who is that? Is it is it the Illuminati who's making? I'm just not sure which they. It's a. You know, I always want to know who the they is. Right? Is it Queen Elizabeth? But you know, um, what's his name got the virus? You know, yep. I, you know, I don't know. I, I I think that you know, yes, it's always been talking about mass population control because we need to control population growth. So we're going to start killing people. So I'm how can we? Say it's aliens, but it's aliens. 5G viruses. If I wanted, I want. If I wanted, you know, large core mass extinction, I would go to a virus and I would manufacture the the vaccine before I let the virus out. Mm -hmm. So and that, the that you want to the protect would be protected. Uh, the website is johnnasta.com. You guys go check out all the good stuff that that and John. Get, uh, John Nasta at Twitter is and where I like to. Do a lot of banter there. At John Nasta on Twitter, you can find him there. John, uh, before we, we go, why don't you go ahead and uh, let people know what you want them to know about this and staying safe. We, we, are, we are at a true inflection point in human history, mediated by, by technology and amazing things. The, the, the Spanish flu was a horrible pandemic, but we had almost nothing. That was just the beginning of things like vaccines. Social distancing was the only tool we had. Today we have uh, immunotherapy. We have natural killer cells that are being investigated that can kill this virus. There are antivirals. There are serums that can be used. There's so many different ways that we can manage this that, that I'm really optimistic about the future. And, and it is not the end of the world. And I don't think that we're gonna stop shaking hands, even though Fauci said it. 
I don't think that we are going to go into this new gloom and doom social isolation. I'm extraordinarily optimistic. We'll get around this curve and we'll have another big issue to deal with, but that's something called humanity. And, and I remain extraordinarily optimistic. And thank you, Joel, for, for what you do and keeping us honest in this in this discussion too. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, John. And thanks everybody for listening and or watching. Of course, subscribe to the Joel Com Show on iTunes or any of the places that you find it. And until next time, wash your damn hands and do good stuff.